vice chair and also lead sponsor of the ordinance uh, authorizing uh, condominium conversion protections in the city of Boston. And uh, we are addressing docket uh, 0184. And we are joined here by uh, uh, Chief uh, Sheila Dillon from the Department of Neighborhood Services and also Bob uh, Garrett, uh, Chief Legal Counsel, uh, to your Managing Director. Uh, sounds great. And we're joined by my colleague, City Council Lydia Edwards, and also my colleague, City Council Matt O'Malley. And we are here today to discuss uh, this matter. And just one housekeeping matter. I know that on the initially um, filed uh, ordinance, uh, we have a change that needs to be read into the record. And it's uh, Section 1 uh, basically says, uh, be it ordained uh, by the City of Boston as follows. Section 1, Section 5 of Chapter 8 of the Ordinance of 1999 is revised such that the phrase, quote, 2014 is stricken where it appears, and the phrase 2019 is substituted. Uh, and then uh, additional language, be it ordained in the City of Boston, Section 1, Section 2-20 uh, of Chapter 10 of the Boston Municipal Code is revised, such that the date, December 31st, 2019, is stricken where it appears, and the phrase, December 31st, 2020, is substituted in its place, filed by the City Council. So just want to get those those two uh, matters on the record uh, from the originally filed document. So uh, with that, um, my colleague, lead sponsor, wants to uh, just give an opening comment and we'll turn it over to the administration and hopefully this can be a quick hearing. Thank you very much. Part of the process that we're engaged in today is looking at our condo um, conversion ordinance and making sure that we, one, declare that it is still necessary in the city of Boston, and then two, uh, because it sunsets on the December 31st, 2019 of this year, we need to renew it. Um, this conversation is about a short-term renewal um, because many of the protections that we have in there, including the right uh, protections for low-income individuals, low to moderate income individuals, elderly and disabled, which allows them up to five years to prevent the eviction, right of first refusal, just cause eviction. Um, we also, this the current version only applies to units that are four or more units. Uh, we are looking now at different issues and some loopholes that we need to close. For example, when people purchase homes and clear out the building and then claim there are no tenants to notify about a condo conversion. And so there's a lot of looking at also the class of individuals where I'd mentioned it's just low income, elderly and disabled. Are there other classes of individuals that are deserving of protections? There's also questions of whether the four or more units um, limit is still applicable and should be looking at lowering that limit to two and three uh, story buildings, unit buildings, excuse me. So these are all wonderful conversations that we've started. But before we renew for an, another five years, we think it's better to renew for one year and have this continued conversation so we can close the loophole, look at the different classes, look at the protections afforded, including right to right of refusal, just cause eviction, as I mentioned, and have that conversation, robust conversation. And then by the end of next year, December 31st, 2020, we extend for what is our typical term of five years. So I wanted to put that out there for my colleague um, colleagues here today to understand what we're doing today, basically maintaining the language, acknowledging where there's some things we need to work on, and then promising or committing to work on them in the year. Yeah, sure. uh, any opening comment from my colleague, uh, Council Malley, waving at that time? So this matter was also sponsored by our other colleague, City Council Josh Zakin as well, and uh, as mentioned, it uh, seeks to extend protections uh, last updated in 2014 for residents. Uh, of covered properties, uh, a notice period, uh, right of first refusal to purchase their unit, relocation assistance, just cause eviction, and relocation benefits if the unit is converted uh, to a condominium. Uh, I'd like to note that this uh, hearing is being streamed on Boston City Council TV online, also being recorded and broadcast on Comcast Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Verizon 1964. Anyone here wishing to offer public testimony may do so now by signing the sheet at the entrance of the chamber. And now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Sheila Dillon, Chief of Housing and Neighborhood uh, Development, who will be providing testimony on behalf of the administration. And she's also joined by uh, Bob Garrett from the from DND. Welcome. Great. Thank you so much. And I will be very brief because I think uh, Councilor Edwards did summarize for the the administration's position. But just for uh, folks that are that are watching uh, this and are interested in this issue, um, Boston is able to provide tenant protections. Um, because the state, through a state enabling act, 
um, an act enabling cities and towns to regulate the conversion of residential property to the condominium forms of ownership. And while the state it laid out some protections, it does give uh, it does give authority to the cities to strengthen those protections. And, and right now, Boston has um, has very good protections on the books. They're not perfect, but if I could just summarize them very quickly, um, right now, if you are uh, low or moderate income, you are elderly or you are handicapped, you have to be given a five-year notice uh, to leave if the owner intends to convert to condominiums you uh, are to receive um, 6,000 for all tenants or 10,000 uh, moving expenses if you are elderly, low income and handicapped. And um, it also provides tenants with just cause eviction during this notice period. So these are good, but these are good protections and they give people a chance to plan and, and uh, make other arrangements. However, as Councillor Edwards mentioned, oftentimes the tenants are long gone by the time uh, a developer comes in to convert the buildings. Uh, I don't want to be sinister, but knowing that these are in place, oftentimes owners of multifamily buildings will sell buildings um, empty because they are more desirable, especially to developers that want to do condo conversions. So we look forward to working with the city council on figuring out how to strengthen these protections, how to make sure that the tenants that were asked to leave uh, know about these protections early or there's look back provisions that are really enforceable. So we are, vi we are fine with um, going ahead and extending this for one year and look forward to some robust conversations in the, in the months to come so we can strengthen this uh, for our Boston residents. Very good. Anything to add on that, Bob? Yeah, I, I'm just basically here to answer uh, questions. Very good. And I was here, obviously, on the council in 2014 and led efforts to have that passed. As you remember, Chief, the relocation costs, um, they were accounted for. Are we, are, do we have an opportunity to, uh, to seek an adjustment um, to those amounts uh, within this um, one year, uh, what are we calling it, sort of a grace period or a sunset period? But uh, that, those those numbers are those figures are five years old mm -hmm. to date, uh, going on six, and uh, probably more than appropriate to take a look at maybe adjusting those figures. I, I think forward. all of this can be looked at, um, and it may be time to adjust upward and give people even more m money to make you know move and, and set themselves up in other locations. Um, so I, I think we can look at that. What is more complicated is looking at the number of units um, that we can that we can oversee. Um, I will ask Bob to uh, sort of outline this for because I think it's important. Um, most of the conversions, as you know, are happening in triple two, fam two and three family homes, um, but the state enabling legislation doesn't allow us to uh, provide tenant protections in those particular types of buildings. Yeah, there's a, a specific provision in um, Chapter 527 of the Acts of 1983 that um, defines a covered housing accommodation as um, uh, having four or more uh, units. So it ex ex uh, explicitly excludes triple deckers and two families and uh, even one families to the extent that mm -hmm. somebody would uh, come to convert them. Right. And uh, back in 2014, um, you had stated that there was 1,312 un rental units that were subject to this ordinance uh, that were converted to condos or cooperative ownership. That was back in 2009. So uh, mm -hmm. what does the data look like now? Um, since we did, we did run the data since 2015. Um, since 2015, 1,020 buildings have been converted from apartments to condominiums, representing 2,938 apartments. Um, and I, as you know, following up on our earlier comment here, 89% of the conversions have occurred in one to three family buildings. So the vast majority are happening in, in <coughs> two and three family buildings. Okay. Very good. We've also been joined by my colleague, City Council Red Flynn. Uh, any, uh, by, before, just for housekeeping, um, Councilor Zakin just wanted me to read into the record. Uh, dear Council Flaherty, I'm sorry I cannot be present for today's committee hearing on docket 0184 regarding condominium conversion protections. As previous chair of the Community on Housing and Community Development, I know how important these protections can be in preventing the displacement of long-term residents. This ordinance provides vital benefits to some of our most vulnerable residents, particularly seniors and those with disabilities. I look forward to reviewing the tape and written testimony from today's hearing and supporting the extension of this ordinance. Sincerely, Josh Sakin, District 8 City Councilor. Thank you. Uh, chair, recognize this Councilor Edwards, any additional comments before so we I wanted questions? to, the only way then, and I, I apologize, I don't have the 
the home, or I guess it was the Enabling Act mm -hmm. um, that discussed four or more units. It's four more units in a building or, or owned four more units to be in total that the person owns. It's in a building. It's in a building. Yeah. So the only way to fix that then is through a home rule petition to amend the Enabling Act? E either amend the Enabling Act or a home rule petition. And it's probably easier to get a home rule petition than amending the Enabling Act. Okay. So at this point then, what's on the, t can we just run through what's on the table for us to look at for the, in the next year? One, there's the, lev the individuals that the, the, uh, the current um, ordinance protects, which includes low to moderate income, mm -hmm. elderly and disabled. Mm -hmm. So there's a, the class of individuals we could look at. Mm -hmm. Then there's the, um, the amount of relocation funds. That's right. And then the re is there additions? Is there a difference between the relocation assistance and relocation benefits? No. 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 Okay. I, I think Just that's. I heard that means the same thing. Uh huh. So we, right now we have right of first refusal that's still on there. Yes. Um, we still have just cause eviction is yes. also applicable. Yes. And then the one of the loopholes is how do we how do we get this to work when someone has cleared out the building? Right. Uh, how do we? How do we truck. prevent that? Can we yeah. hook it back in? Yeah, I mean, those, those individuals technically, if they were elderly, low, low moderate, moderate income, mm -hmm. or disabled, had every right to stay there mm -hmm. for another five years, but they're Correct. gone. Correct. So right. what do we do as a city? And so that's one of our challenges. How yeah. do we work with maybe the Registry of Deeds, mm -hmm. figuring out all these different things? Right. So. We had thought about some kind of a extra permit or extra approval um, that uh, a condo developer would need to provide to the city telling us who was living there, when they left, you know, so that they would be buying something with eyes wide open that they had obligation. Mm -hmm. So, but I think these are, are details we can get into, but we too would like to make sure that the residents that were living there know of their rights and, and get, those, get those benefits before they leave. But again, 89% of the condo conversions yes. are happening between one to three unit buildings, so only this would, if enacted and if we did these additional changes, it would only be for 11% of the condo conversions in Boston. That is correct. And, you know, I think we're, we're very interested in exploring smaller buildings, um, but you know how difficult it is to get a home rule petition passed at the state. Is there any opportunity now where we're seeing where folks have not registered uh, properly for their Airbnbs that uh, they missed the window, if you will? So are, there's, are there a potential available properties that would sort of fall into this category where uh, they're going to be removed from the platform, mm -hmm. so they're not going to be able to sort of advertise uh, their Airbnb unit? But my expectation would be that we'd see a significant number of units potentially maybe coming back online. It's a very good point. There may be, because of December 1st, if you didn't have a registration exactly. number, you you have to actually rent an apartment to, right. to a, a, a tenant. Right. Um, so we might see people that were used to making a certain amount of money on them and now those properties aren't as desirable to own, so we may see more come on the market. It's a very good point. So that does, I think, make you know, we should be working very, very quickly in the beginning of the new year then to capture as many of those sales as possible. Yeah, hope is that they come back online and they're offered to folks that are living in the neighborhoods. Um, other than that, the property and most of it, their investment properties, they're gonna be sitting there not collecting any, uh, any income, offsetting, you know, mortgage or an, an investment. So I think there may be a window for us to kind of ramp it up and try to put people into homes and apartments, right? I think that's a very good point. Chair recognizes Council Flynn. Any questions at this time? Yeah, thank you, Council Flaherty. And I want to say thank you to the panelists for your work on this important issue, but especially I want to say thank you to Council Edwards and Council Zakem for their, their work on uh, filing this reauthorization. It's important that we have this condo conversion ordinance in place so that we can continue to protect our tenants who might face displacement due to condo conversions. As we all know, we're in a housing crisis, so we need all the tools available to help our working families, our, our immigrant neighbors as well, our elderly persons with disability, disabilities to stay in our neighborhoods. The condo conversion ordinance is an important tool that provides protections, such as a notice period, right of first refusal to purchase the unit, relocation assistance and benefits. 
It's, a, it's an important ordinance. I think we can use this as, as a roadmap for other types of measures to provide protections against displacement, unjust evictions that we're, we're constantly seeing in the city, especially for our seniors, as I mentioned, persons with disability, low-income residents, um, our immigrant neighbors. We have seen long-time residents that are getting evicted with short notice, with an ex expensive rental and housing market, very difficult for these tenants to find new homes in a short period of time. Um, a lot of people that are doing development are buying these triple-deckers and evicting elderly people, someone in their 80s, and, it, and then there, it's up to the elderly person to try to find a, 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 a place to live in a short period of time. That's unconscionable in our city. You know, with our city is booming. Everyone's making a lot of money. Developers are making a lot of money. And who's paying the price for it is these seniors that have been living in Boston for a long period of time. You know, you know, persons with disabilities, our immigrants. So, you know, these developers are pushing these longtime residents out. They're pushing out vulnerable people, our neighbors. Very unfair. That's not what Boston's all about. Uh, I believe that tenants who have lived in properties for five years or more should be provided at least one year's notice to vacate following property transfers, maybe, maybe longer, maybe five years, along with information regarding resources available to assist with searching for new housing, while seniors, the disabled, low-income residents should be afforded uh, maybe twice that. Um, Reauthorizing this ordinance is very important. Again, I want to say thank you to Councilor Edwards, Councilor Zakem, and I hope we can continue using this ordinance as an example of what we can do to expand projections for tenants in our city. Um, so my, my question is, um, is, was this ordinance last updated in 2014? Yes, yes, yes. Why, why did we, why was this such a long wait from 2014 to the, to the present to, to update this? Because it expires in 2019, yeah. so, um, <clears throat> It, it was in place for the, the, that time period from 2014 to 2019. And then we'll update it again for how many years? For the clarification, to, yep. to, to my good uh, friend and colleague, uh, Councillor Flynn, we are, um, because of all those suggestions that you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, we realize we're running up against the clock. This will sunset on December 31st of this year. Mm -hmm. And so instead of doing the five year extension, what well, we've uh, thought made more efficient and allowed us the time to really get to the real crux of these issues is a one-year extension this okay. time to go to December 31st, 2020. By that time, Councillor Flynn, we, based on all of the suggestions you just made, mm -hmm. several of the suggestions the administration's made, myself and Councillor Flaherty have made, these loopholes we need to close, we need to have a robust conversation, we will have a new council, all mm -hmm. of those things, and we thought it would make more sense to allow for them to be a part of that conversation. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thank you but, for uh, But we did not want it to be five years, you know. Right. Right, we wanted it to one year so that they don't have, you know, all, all of the time in the world. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Council Edwards, uh, for that helpful information and for your work. Um, Sheila, I was wondering which neighborhoods have seen the largest share of condo conversions? So uh, since 2015 to 2019, um, the, the neighborhoods, the four top neighborhoods uh, are Dorchester at 198 buildings, East Boston with 163 buildings, mm -hmm. South Boston with 141 buildings, and Rosendale with 115 buildings. I mean, I, I can get you every neighborhood council, counselor, um, but those are the top four. Now, what about some of the smallest, smaller neighborhoods um, that might not have those large numbers? Percentage-wise, do we have that broken down? Um, you know, for the smaller neighborhoods, such as, such as Chinatown, Chinatown. or um, the Fenway area, or, mm -hmm. you know, the Back Bay, or some areas of downtown. Yeah, so um, we, we do have some of those, like Fen Fenway didn't see any conversions in that that same time period. Uh, Chinatown is, we call it central, it, it, it's Chinatown and in some of the downtown neighborhoods, and there were 14 buildings there. 
Um, but we can get this to you. And if you have further questions, we can even get you probably, we can get you addresses. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to get the addresses. I was over there this weekend and I was by the row houses that you've mm -hmm. been there also, yep. Sheila and, and, and Council Flaherty as well. Um, and I know, I know we are making some progress working with, um, working with the community, but what, how can we ensure that our long time immigrants in our city, whether it's in my district or someone else's district, what protections are we giving them that they're just not gonna be pushed out of this city for the sake of a, a developer because they wanna, they want that piece of property and they wanna make money and so what do we do? We push the immigrant neighbors right out um, out of their place so a developer can, can build there. What are, we, what are we doing to prevent that? So we have some tools and, and you know, um, as we talked about last week, we are trying to build a lot of additional affordable housing, especially in neighborhoods like Chinatown and East Boston where we're seeing rents rise. Um, and we do have, we are seeking permission from the state, and we're very, very close to allowing us, as we do build new units, uh, to give priority to families uh, and individuals that are rent burdened to get those new units. Um, so that would, be, that would be very, very helpful. We don't have rent control in the city. That was, you know, voted out in, in 1993, 94, 94. 94. 94. Yeah. Five, <laughs> in the 90s. Yeah. Um, so we don't have those kind of protections. So um, what we do is we, we work very, very hard all day long to talk to owners and, and you know, ask them to do the right thing. So I think we need to increase supply, make sure the, pres we, the affordable housing that we have in neighborhoods we, we preserve, and then all we can do around rent protections is appeal to owners better selves and, you know, ask them very, very, you know, politely but strongly not to raise rents to a point where people have to leave. So we're doing everything we can within the tools that we have, Councillor. And we're also working with Councillor Edwards and others to have nonprofits buy buildings that, that with existing tenants in them, and we need to scale that, that, that program up. We just um, celebrated our 75th unit in East Boston. Um, and it might not sound like a lot, but there were 75 families in living in those units, so that really is good news. We need to do a lot more of that. The, I, I know you follow the housing trends as well as anyone, but that must have been a, a devastating, um, devastating issue uh, when the city of Boston lost rent control, the state lost rent control, um, had a devastating impact on the neighborhoods of our city. And, you know, did we ever do a, a case study of when rent control was stopped, who was evicted? Um, do we track the, that data and do we track it by ethnic group? Do we track it by neighborhood? Okay. Um, and, you know, if we do have that data, could we, could we get some of that information? I'm gonna hand this over, if it's okay, I'm gonna hand this yeah. over to my colleague who was actually working in the field at that time, I was not, but if you could give some observations. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that we have a lot of good data uh, on that from, from that uh, time period. Uh, there are a very small number of um, elderly people who are, are still covered by some of the provisions of the old uh, uh, rent control law, uh, kind of conversion protections, but it's a handful. And I, you know, we don't really have uh, much information on income levels, race, and ethnicity of the, the folks that were impacted back at that time. I look across my district um, when I was when I was a kid, and it was a, it was a city of working class families, of low income residents, of of, of elderly, of persons with disabilities, and I, now I see a lot of young wealthy people and people call that progress. I don't necessarily call it progress when we evict immigrants, when we evict um, seniors, when we evict long-time residents that have, that have been here for a long period of time that are struggling to make ends meet. Boston should be a city for everybody, especially for low-income workers. Um, I, I, I think we kind of lost our soul when we lost rent control um, many years ago, and I don't, I don't really think we, we did a good job of fighting back for our tenants and support of our tenants. So, um, 
you know, maybe this is, this is an opportunity to do that. So again, I want to say thank you to Councilor Edwards, Councilor uh, Zakem, and, and Councilor Flaherty. Thank, thank you to the Walsh administration and to the panelists as well. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. And uh, Chief, just, just sort of thinking of this, five, five um, cases this uh, month alone, just for the month of November. I know two were in um, Council Flynn and I's neighborhood. One was in Eastie, one was in Charlestown, both the Councilor Edwards district, and one was in Dorchester where you have a middle-aged or older adult uh, living with an elderly parent, mm -hmm. um, taking care of the elderly parent. <coughs> elderly parent dies. Yeah. Other siblings and or their spouses get involved. They then probate the home. That person basically gets evicted. Um, and you got two issues going on there. They're, you know, they're, they're making, they're making, they're making enough money, but not enough to qualify for any of the affordable mm -hmm. housing programs, but not enough to afford their own place. Coupled with the fact that they're going to get a windfall if they're going to be the beneficiaries of the sale of the estate. And as you know, a lot of the property being sold now, particularly for elderly folks, that is um, where there are no encumbrances, there's no mortgages on them. Uh, average price, you, you can envision, uh, they just get, gave you the neighborhoods of where that would fetch and whether there's two kids or there's six kids, there's gonna be, a, I guess, a temporary estate windfall for that individual that's gonna knock them out of the box. And I just want to put that on your radar. Literally five, right. uh, five families this month alone uh, have, have called the office just looking for assistance to see what, if anything's available for them or their sibling, um, because they're in the process of probating uh, the, the family home, if you will, and that person was living in there, either rent-free or at a discount or whatever, and now um, probate lawyers come in and they, you know, there's someone that has a fiduciary responsibility to the estate and uh, the executor has to take certain actions and as a result of which, there's someone gonna be displaced um, and they're in that kind of catch-22 spot mm -hmm. where they're not making enough money uh, to sort of sustain themselves on a market-rate apartment, but at the same time, they're currently maybe making just a little too much to get mm -hmm. any subsidy, but then mm -hmm. there's going to be a period of time where they're going to get a little bit of a windfall right. um, that's going to knock them out of the box, and I just don't know what, if any, consideration is being given to sort of that category, and it's happening more often. Uh, I'm hearing it more often. I know my colleagues will be hearing it more often and uh, they're lifelong residents of the city. They add tremendous value to, to our neighborhoods, and uh, those are the folks we don't want to lose. Agreed. And unfortunately, through, through no fault of their own, it's, there was a death in their family, and, and, the, and the property's being probated, um, yeah. and they're not making enough to be able to hang on. So yeah. uh, I know there's worse situations, mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. I just want to put that in a category is there's yeah. a group of folks that are, <coughs> are, are being priced out as well, and, uh, and if there's anything we can do for them. Uh, so, I, you know, I... I I agree, we're getting the calls as well, not so much the probate calls, maybe getting more of those, just, just elderly people being asked to leave for various reasons. We did file, the mayor filed a bill at the State House, and it, it said two things, that elderly people could not be evicted unless there was just cause. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the cause could not be rent increases. It could only rent, raise the rents 5% per year. I've worked really hard on trying to move that bill out of committee, and it's got very little traction. And it was a start of talking about the right thing to do, rent regulation, all of the above. But it's, it's just, I, you know, it's frustrating because I think we see situations on the ground, and then we have to so often go up to the state house to get permission to do what we think is right. And right. sorry if I sound a little frustrated. It is very frustrating because you, you know, you look around, you go, wow, no one should be taking our seniors and asking them to leave a short notice or raising the rents. You say hey, we're going to do something about it and then the bills languish up at the State House. Mm -hmm. So it, it is frustrating. We are also trying to build a lot of additional senior housing with the range of incomes, some more middle and, and some very low. Um, and we've got a pipeline of about 1,000 units, which was really hard to, to do because we, we, just, we, didn't, we didn't see a pipeline of new elderly housing. So we're working really hard on advancing that as well in almost every neighborhood. So I think we have to continue to build more affordable housing for our seniors at a range of incomes, and we do have to pass legislation that would provide necessary protections. Right. And I just want to, you to be sensitive to like that, the, the range or the zone, if you yeah. will. So I know yeah. that we're... You know, and again, this is really more mm -hmm. to try to prevent Boston be, from becoming the city of the very rich and the yeah. very poor. But there are some folks that you know that have you know pretty decent jobs, but yet still not able to pay the market rent. And mm -hmm. can we start to see at least um, you know a menu of maybe 150, 160, 170 uh, on the AMI side um, when we're putting together some numbers? I know that we're using on the lower side for yeah, 
Yeah, that, that seems a bit a bit high based right. on what we're seeing. But I right. think we should talk about what the rate, what what your what households, what are you seeing as far as incomes, right. and then and shape some of these developments accordingly. Right. And I use the example. It's you know it's it's the kid that's born and raised in the city that. Uh, you know, it's college educated, mm -hmm. they're strapped with some student mm -hmm. loan debt, they have a pretty good entry level job, they're not crushing it, but they're making just a little too much to qualify for any of that other assistance, but they're carrying some debt. They got their student loan debt and, and, and some other debt, and it's what can we do for that? Because those, right. those are the folks that are, again, they're the ones that played Little League and youth hockey, yeah. and they grew up in our neighborhoods, that's where their family, their support system is, and we're starting to see them go down to Hingham and Weymouth and, and, mm -hmm. and Marshfield, et cetera. Um, and then for those in Lydia's district, it's an interesting thing. People from South Boston go south. People in, in her district go north. So <laughs> she sees more Stoneham and Malden mm -hmm. and Medford. But um, but nonetheless, in Linfield. But yeah. they leave Boston. And mm -hmm. we want to try to capture that. So while we're trying to take care of the most vulnerable, we also do have a segment uh, of, of society in our neighborhoods that really, really want to continue to be part of right. uh, the fabric of our community. But again, they're just, they're just missing the mark on qualifying right. for anything. But yet they have some debt that they have to that has to be factored in and okay. uh, and it's like what can we do and can we move the percentages even if on a particular project it's two units are mm -hmm. for a, a higher uh, higher bracket they just trying to be all encompassing and trying yep. to protect as many city residents and that's the that's what we're hearing whether it's the probate situation or it's the the young man or woman that's uh, graduated from school and has a pretty good entry level job but just can't yep. qualify for anything but wants to stay but they can't afford anything in the neighborhood that they were born and raised in so yep. I think you raised two good, two interesting ideas, and one I'm starting to look at. Um, can we do? Can we start working with the banks in a mortgage product that would somehow allow people to buy modest-priced homes and also start paying off student debt? Is there a way of combining those two? Right. Um, there is a Let program. Me know. In, what's that? I said, "Let me know." Yeah. <laughs> but but it would, I think we should look at. It. I think it's a really good idea. Yeah, sure. And then one other thing, we met last week with a lot of the private developers in Boston and saying that, you know, we're working really hard to um, build more affordable housing as much as we can on city land. We're, we're working really hard at it. And it would, it would, it really, we really do need the market to respond and build something, you know, that's more moderately priced for, for folks that want to buy a new home or that are making, you know, have a good salary, but they, you know, they're not, they're not independently wealthy. And so we really do need the market to respond with more, more right. additional product as well. And we also have a lot of folks in the 65 and over crowd, or maybe even, you know, it could be a little mm -hmm. lower than that, that they're overhoused, right? So all the kids are growing yes, and they're out. Yes, very much. But yet again, they're, they're sort of house rich, cash yes. poor. Mm -hmm. They sell their house, they're gonna get a windfall, they're gonna knock themselves out of the box for any of those, but they would very much like to be maybe in sort of a senior community, if yes. you will. Um, and how we could kind of, mm -hmm. you know, I guess bridge that gap of someone that again is fixed income until they sell the property. Right. The minute they sell the property, they get a windfall. The windfall is not going to last their lifetime, but it does knock them out of the box for any type of of, uh, of assistance and subsidy mm -hmm. from our program. So, I, but they're all they're all a lot of moving parts. There um, are right, and there's not a one size fits all. If we can start to think mm -hmm. about these different sort of groups and categories of individuals who live in our city and have made the city the great city that it is and they want to stay, um, how do we keep them here? And I know that's a challenge. I know you work extremely hard to try to yeah. find answers for that, but just while we're talking about it, I wanted to throw out a couple scenarios yeah. that have been percolating. In those are, no, those are good numbers. suggestions. There is there is the model It's in um, on the border of JP in West Roxbury, the Sophia Snow House, where people that sold their homes were able to almost buy in they, they do, they buy in, they live there very, very reasonably because they're taking their asset and they're buying in. And then when they leave, either when they pass away or when they leave, go into a different situation, they get like 90% of what they bought in and what they paid to buy in back or their family does. And it's, it is a model that uh, Two Life in Brighton is looking at as well. So I think there are those situations where people's incomes are limited, but they do have an asset. So how do we work with them to right. make sure that they have a safe yeah. living situation? True. And you, you get a kid that comes across the stage, gets his or her college diploma or even a graduate degree, and they're 300 grand or more in debt. It's, that's someone that's never going to be able, able to mm -hmm. afford their own place to live. I mean, they're going to be digging out for decades. Right. That's that's a horrible situation. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I think we're in agreement then. So we're going to do sort of a one-year extension, if you will. Then we'll come back, address the issues that yeah. uh, we sort of uh, mentioned here. I know Councilor Edwards will be working um, uh, her um, 
transfer relations with respect, particularly probably up around the registry of deeds as well as mm -hmm. uh, we need to look at maybe adjusting the figures that uh, when we come back at this thing, it'll, those figures will be six years old on the relocation cost and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, hopefully get a, give a one year extension and mm -hmm. then we could um, put together these moving, solve these moving parts for a Great. five year extension. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Anything thank else you. good? Anything else of us? Very good, so that will conclude uh, the hearing uh, with respect to um, docket uh, 0184, an ordinance reauthorizing condominium conversion protections in the city of Boston. That matter was sponsored by Council Lydia Redwoods and Council Josh Sakin and referred to the committee on January the 16th and the committee on uh, government operations is adjourned. Thank you. Mm -hmm.